Good morning, everyone. Today on Perspectives, we continue to explore and seek answers to perplexing and frustrating questions related to the coronavirus pandemic and not all of them medical. So far, we've talked with governmental and health leaders as well as law enforcement officials. Now we look at how COVID-19 continues to impact our everyday lives from work or the lack of and the state of our emotional health. The COVID-19 pandemic will go down in history as an event that has forever changed us. The latest unemployment figures for our section of South Alabama make it clear that too many people have lost their jobs and are looking for work. In April of this year, almost 29,000 people were unemployed in Mobile County. In Baldwin County, the percentage of those out of work is close now to 16% with more than 14,000 filing for unemployment. And what about those businesses who are closed or struggling to stay open? The Federal Small Business Administration indicates that Alabama businesses have received more than $1.5 billion in loans in the second phase of the government's Paycheck Protection Program. The SBA says that the average loan size is about $73,000. Now, what about the emotional toll that this has taken? A national public foundation called the Wellbeing Trust released a study indicating that the COVID-19 pandemic is leading now to some 75,000 additional deaths from alcohol, drug misuse, and suicide. Mental health officials call it another epidemic, quote, the deaths of despair. So there are many who are fighting the despair of unemployment, bankruptcy, and mental anguish. This morning, we're going to talk with those who are in the forefront of that fight. Joining us this morning are Bill Sisson, president and CEO of the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce. Also joining us, Virginia Guy, the executive director of Mobile's Drug Education Council. And we'll also talk with Derek Bulware, who is the chief executive officer of Housing First Incorporated. He will share how the homeless community's daily challenges have increased due to the ramifications of COVID-19. Much to discuss and share when Perspectives continues in just a moment. And as we mentioned, Bill Sisson, the president and CEO of the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce, joins us this morning to talk more about the feel of the business community. Bill, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning to you. Thank you for um, asking me to join you. Give me an idea of the viewers this morning and what's going on in the business community. What's the move that you're hearing from the last two months that we've had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic changes to almost everything that we do now in the business world? Well, we've been staying in very close contact with our membership. Um, we, our entire staff, has been reaching out to our almost 2,000 members to, uh, you know, get feedback from them to understand what we could be doing as a business organization to help them through the pandemic. Um, I will tell you that we've also done some um, significant surveying during this time to understand what the impact of COVID-19 has had on the business community. Um, as you might imagine, it's been uh, very impactful. Uh, nine out of 10 uh, businesses have been impacted by COVID-19. I'm assuming that um, the, the rest of them are maybe retail establishments, those that have been able to continue to operate, but the rest of the business community has certainly been affected. They are um, having to furlough employees. Uh, we've seen that. About 50% of those that have furloughed employees have um, not brought the furloughed employees back yet. So that's certainly having an impact um, on, the, on the business community as well. Um, on a positive note, we did ask in our recent survey how they felt about uh, Q3 and Q4, what the third quarter and the fourth quarter would look like for them from a business standpoint. Uh, the third quarter, again, not surprisingly, they're very concerned about um, sales and production during that quarter. But the optimistic thing is, is that they see in Q4 that uh, they'll see an increase in sales 
and, and productivity. So I think those are those are some of the um, indicators. Some good information there. Now, when you talk about starting again for many of the small business people, uh, how difficult is that going to be? Because uh, for the novice who has no understanding about the inner workings of a business, it sounds simple enough, just open the door up and expect customers to come in. But how difficult will it be for some of these who have really are on the edge, so to speak, as it relates to surviving? You know, Eric, one of the things that I've been most impressed about is just how seriously the entire business community, small, medium, and large businesses, have been taking uh, this reopening. Uh, some have continued to operate and were not shut down, um, you know, during the stay-at-home order, but many were. And so, as they've begun the return to work, they have plans in place. Um, certainly, they're thinking about things like um, personal protection equipment for their employees and for their uh, customers. Uh, we have set up, uh, you know, resources for them. We have a guidebook that our staff worked very diligently to get out to the business community to help them in this restart phase. And so uh, it's a process and it's a gradual process. But again, um, those businesses are, are really prepared for this and, and doing everything they can do to get the economy rolling again. What percentage do you think uh, in our community are we going to lose? How many of our small businesses? You know, that's very difficult to say right now, Eric, but I think, um, you know, to not candy coat anything, certainly we're going to lose some businesses. Um, just like during the Great Recession uh, a number of years ago, we did see a decline in the number of businesses in the community. It's just difficult to say yet because, um, you know, we're not we're not finished with this. I mean, this is still ongoing, and so um, it, it will probably reveal itself in the next uh, few months, certainly throughout the summer. Now, the chamber is involved in helping them re-employ people. You've got a job fair taking place. In fact, it's a uh, virtual job fair to be a part of the process, helping them ease back into getting their staff back in place. Yes, thank you for asking uh, about that. Uh, we tried something new, a virtual job fair. Uh, a number of our companies, um, you know, were, were, were involved in that and, and potential um, employees were involved in that. It went very well and uh, basically trying to connect people who are currently unemployed with the positions that are available um, in the community. And I think the good news there is, is that there are jobs that are available and that we will see more and more of this um, virtual job fair um, type system. So we're we're adjusting just like everyone else um, at the chamber. We're starting to look at doing our events virtually now. And um, so the job fair was an example of that. And as you wrap us up here, tell us what is the stay safe, stay local campaign exactly? So that is a way for us on our, our, our Facebook um, to help restaurants and other retail establishments uh, who needed to continue to operate but in a very different way to get the message out there that curbside service was available for some of these restaurants and, and other type of, of businesses that were continuing to operate but in a very different way. Um, and so that's been very popular. We have, you know, almost uh, 2,000 people that follow that. And it's been a way to promote the business community during the pan pandemic. All right, Bill Sisson, the president and CEO of Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce, we thank you so much for bringing us up to date on where we are in our business community. Thank you so much, Eric. And once again, Bill Sisson. Meantime, when we come back this morning, we talk to Virginia Guy, executive director of Mobile's Drug Education Council. Perspectives continues in just a moment. And now joining us, Virginia Guy, the executive director of the Drug Education Council in Mobile. And Virginia, we've been talking about this pandemic and sometimes uh, we don't always understand how far and wide and reaching this can have an effect on the lives of people. And as we look at some of our friends and relatives and other people in the community, they're dealing with some issues during this time that uh, added new stress due to the pandemic and how it affects uh, the centers being open, their treatment programs, maintaining the same type of uh, hours. Uh, this has far reaching effects. Tell us how and what you're seeing through the Drug Education Council. 
Right. Before this pandemic hit, we already had an opioid epidemic crisis going on. And this pandemic has really just kind of thrown fuel on the fire of that opioid and addiction epidemic. So people, individuals and families struggling with addiction and substance use disorder, this just added another layer of, um, of trouble on top of what they already had. Um, but the good news is that treatment centers are still open and they are accepting uh, clients. It's a little more difficult now. They have to do a lot more protocol to get in. But we really recommend that all families reach out for help during this time. This is actually an excellent time uh, to seek treatment. How does that social distancing work into causing some of those issues where uh, things are different the way they have been? Right. You know, we've often said that the opposite of addiction is connection. And even though we're physically separated, we really need to look at ways to stay connected. So I want to encourage all families that have a loved one struggling with substance use disorder addiction to stay connected. And also people in recovery, particularly people young in recovery, new in recovery, to reach out and stay connected. Um, I'd like to ask the old timers in recovery to, uh, to reach out to some of the younger folks in recovery and make sure that they're doing okay. You know, with a lot of the technology and the different um, the different applications that we have, there's a lot of creative ways that we're able to stay connected as a recovering community. Talk about how the loss of employment as well as the whole change in the financial system for the folks where they've lost their income. How has this affected uh, this whole area of looking at other ways to deal with issues? Right. You know, the total disruption of our lives, whether it's um, loss of employment, the uncertainty of employment, um, you know, uh, lack of uh, having um, a regular routine. You know, we have to have a new routine now, you know, doing things in a new way that are often more challenging and a little bit difficult. This all is incredibly stressful for um, people struggling with substance use disorder. Also, I'm concerned about the long term impact of this on children and families. You know, we need to not forget the younger children children at home that are um, struggling to understand this. This is an excellent opportunity for parents to talk to their kids about their fears and appropriate ways of handling stress uh, during this time. And it's a good time for parents to model appropriate use of stress so these kids don't end up turning to alcohol and drugs in order to cope uh, with these troubling times. We've heard about a lot of more uh, drinking going on now than in the past because of people being shut in. Have you heard any information from that standpoint? point. Yes, you know, we know that alcohol and drug sales are skyrocketing uh, during these times. You know, I really want to encourage, you know, everybody to think about their drinking, um, you know, to pay, be very aware of how much they're drinking and try not to drink more than they were drinking before this pandemic hit. You know, we know that that's not a good way uh, to cope. And, you know, so we want to encourage everybody to look at really appropriate ways of coping, which, you know, using things like exercise, um, you know, this is a great time for families to discuss their faith, to talk about their family values, um, to look at ways that they can cope going on. It looks like it's going to be a long time, you know, before we're really completely through this, um, this pandemic. And so this is a great time to teach the people in our families appropriate ways to deal with this type of stress and to model really good behavior. As we wrap up, when you talk about the family issue, how important is it for those to be respective of the precautions that we're being advised to do by the CDC where young and old are mixing and of course there's a concern about folks who are over 50? That's a huge concern. You know, we need to be very cautious of our younger people. I know they're anxious to get out and get back together with all their friends, and and uh, but then we need to be careful that they don't come back home to older parents and grandparents that are quarantined and spread those those germs. You know, we need to be just very cautious and protective of the most vulnerable in our community. And um, you know, I think teaching young people that um, I think this is a great opportunity for them to learn those type of lessons. And very quickly, Virginia, the deaths of despair. Have we seen an increase in those numbers in our local area during this period? 
We absolutely have. You know, we refer to the deaths of despair as uh, deaths from alcohol, drugs, or suicide. And there is a big increase between January and April of 2020 compared to that same time last year. So um, reach out if you know somebody suffering from mental illness, if you know somebody suffering with an alcohol or drug disorder, please reach out, connect with them. Let's get them the appropriate help that they need. And let's make sure that we don't continue to see these increase in deaths. Virginia Guy, Executive Director of the Drug Education Council, we thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Very valuable information there shared by Virginia Guy and of course, Executive Director of Mobile's Drug Education Council. Now, up next this morning, Derek Bolware, Chief Executive Officer of Housing First Incorporated. He'll share more about our homeless community. Perspectives, we'll be right back. Joining us now, Derek Bolware. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Housing First, Inc., which is the lead agency in Mobile and Baldwin counties. They are also providing the housing and case management support to those experiencing homelessness. We thank you for joining us this morning. If you would tell us, how has this pandemic affected our homeless community? We've seen national stories about uh, an impact, in fact. In fact, I think I heard one story on National Public Radio talking about people in our area here in Alabama experiencing this situation from uh, the whole change in losing employment and, of course, the whole financial change to their homes. So how, how has it impacted our community? Well, Eric, the, the need for housing assistance or, or housing for the homeless has increased during this pandemic. And you know, our own data would, uh, would weigh that out. We've seen about a 38% increase in the number of individuals that have come to Housing First seeking our assistance uh, during this pandemic. So uh, the need has just increased. Um, whether or not it's, it's directly from fear of, of losing their job or becoming literally homeless, uh, the two things are happening at the same time, but we have certainly seen an increase in those that are, are requesting our help. Now, I know that you are part of a coalition of other organizations that uh, work on this situation in here, uh, our South Alabama area. How have you all come together at this time? Because this is really even hurting nonprofits because of what has happened. Right. And, and you're right. During times like this, this is where people do pull together. And of course, in Mobile and Baldwin County, our service area, uh, Housing First is, is working within the continuum of care, which is that network of agencies. Uh, everyone that, that you can think of from Penelope House, Salvation Army, Family Promise, the list goes on and on. But we have been mutually supportive and will continue to do so. It's, a, it's certainly a time when, when our agencies pull together. Uh, for this this one cause that we're in here for so give us an idea who we're talking about because we're not talking about just uh, homeless men in this situation what the pandemic is causing are we no absolutely not it's it's men women children uh, veterans uh, it's affecting everyone and you know this is something to keep in mind it's difficult uh, for you and I to remain safe we, we have a home to go back to we have our own uh, bathroom facilities uh, but if you're homeless the idea of taking care of yourself during a pandemic um, the level of difficulty just goes straight up from there and the idea of social distancing uh, when you really uh, often have to uh, uh, get together with other people just for survival. And then, of course, we really don't know who has the virus and who hasn't. Um, testing for it hasn't really happened uh, on a, to a group like this, so we really don't know what the effects are currently, um, and, and it may be months before we know the real impact. Is that something that's being considered in the community where more testing provided to our homeless community? You know, I'm not sure exactly uh, where they are on a testing for the homeless community, um, but but certainly it's as far as I know today, uh, it's not a widespread uh, thing. I know that I believe Franklin Healthcare is testing right now at one fixed location, uh, but they're the only one that I know of that is is addressing uh, the homeless population, for instance, when it comes to to uh, Corona testing. 
how has the employment situation, because it has changed now to where there are not jobs as uh, easily accessible, has that been a major effect also in the frustration? I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we're averaging about 25 to 27% of those that come to Housing First that say that they are in danger of losing their, their housing because their, their job is ended. Um, which is kind of interesting because it tracks pretty much to what it was last year. The difference, Eric, is really the underlying population, the number of people that are now experiencing the risk of losing their home and those that are actually are literally homeless. So, um, you know, again, there isn't a report that's been published yet from our area that can definitively say this is what is causing this uptick. We just know that between the two months of uh, the uh, during this coronavirus of this year versus last year, we've seen a 38% increase in the number of people that have come to us seeking help. Um, that's about a 30% overall from uh, those that are already in our system from last year to this year. So it's an anomaly. But it's it, it, it clearly the, the only thing that is reasonable to assume is that coronavirus is having a direct impact on our community and our homeless community and our numbers and our, our data is, is proving so. And as we conclude this, where do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see it coming in the next few months or is it going to take a little while? Oh, Eric, if I had that answer, I, I know you would love to, to have it too. We all would. Uh, I don't know. I don't know when the end is going to come. I do know what our situation is. Our situation is we have a limited pool of resources and we have a very great and growing need. Um, and I think, I think for, for your, your audience, if, if they're interested in, in being involved in the solution right now, the answer when it comes to this conversation is resources uh, need to be brought in for this so we can address this, this uptick. If nothing more, to address the 38% that we're seeing, this is the time to get involved. If, you, if you're interested in financially supporting uh, this cause, this would be the time to do it. Uh, probably never more have we needed that support than we need now. Derek Bullware, Chief Executive Officer of Housing First, Inc. We thank you so much for joining us today and giving us an update on where we are in the service area that you provide here to South Alabama. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. And once again, Derek Bullware, Chief Executive Officer of Housing First Incorporated. Now we thank all three of our guests this morning for sharing their perspective on the broad reaching effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next on Perspectives, the hurricane season is officially here and the 2020 forecast now calling for a more active above normal season. So what does that mean for us here on the Gulf Coast and how will the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic play into the picture? We'll talk to Fox 10's chief meteorologist, a tropical weather specialist as well with the Coastal Research Center and the deputy director of the Baldwin County Emergency Management Agency. The three of them will tell us how to be better prepared for what could come our way. And please join us here next Saturday morning at 9 for Perspectives as we discuss important issues and seek solutions. And don't forget now, if you have ideas of topics that you'd like for us to address, just send it to us here at Perspectives. That's at fox10tv.com. And of course, I'm Eric Reynolds and wishing you have a very great week ahead.